Thanks to all our subscribers. If you are a subscriber, you're getting the ad-free version. This podcast will have swear words in it. Just a warning. So not only do you get no ads, you get free swears. Hello and welcome to episode 235 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, I finally hear why a political party I've supported in the past is not talking about climate. In their own words, they're cowards. And it's painfully obvious they don't listen to this show, Brian. Who doesn't listen to this show? I don't listen to the show. I find it kind of frivolous. But anyway... The city of Louisville has gone with all-electric garbage trucks. You might be surprised to learn that Kentucky is going green like that. And it's not. There's a Louisville in Colorado. I knew it! (laughs) Scientists have discovered that if you burn a forest at lower temperature, it doesn't release much carbon. It's called biochar, a form of coal. But don't worry, Donald Trump will still get regular, clean, beautiful coal in his stocking this Christmas. In the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, a nonprofit is bringing help with solar panels and batteries instead of diesel generators. These microgrids are powering things like food trucks. Who knew that food trucks could get even more trendy? I wish we had disaster relief food trucks. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. You're listening to The Clean Energy Show your weekly guide to the evolving world of energy, transportation, and more as the world comes together to tackle a warming climate. And also this week, a electric, all-electric hydrofoil ferry service in Sweden, solar on religious institutions, on their buildings, and a lot more. And uh, I wanted to let everyone know that Apple Podcast subscriptions are now active uh, for our podcast. So if you are an Apple user and you use the native Apple Podcast app, you'll see an option to subscribe to our show for $1.99 in your own currency, whether in your Australia, the UK, Mars. Okay, the same price, kind of. It's kind of the same price, which is nice. It's, it's, it's whatever it is where you live, that's what Apple allows you to do. And I made it a bit higher in Saudi Arabia. Don't ask me why. I just, <laughs> I, we show up on the charts there sometimes, and they're going to pay for it. <laughs> anyway, you get... While you support our climate podcast, which supports climate communication, and you get ad-free episodes, which is nice, early access to the show as soon as it's out of the oven, and many bonus episodes. Not quite the full amount of bonus that you get when you spend five bucks on the Clean Club on Patreon, but this is another option. You don't have to leave your app. You can just click it right there. And yeah, everyone listening to the show on Apple Podcasts should subscribe and support our show because it would be very helpful to me. Great. Okay, so I've been watching This Old House again. We uh, ended up talking about this quite a lot last season on This Old House. This is the PBS television show where they refurbish older houses. And it was a very elaborate project last season, which in itself was really interesting. But there were lots of clean energy upgrades, a lot of insulation. They did a ton of solar panels and they even did geothermal heating, you know, all kinds of stuff on a, on a house from the 1960s. And anyway, the new season has started. This is a house from 1929. It's in Nashville. It's a sort of a brick cottage, not a very big house. And they start talking about it in the first episode and, and I could tell right away, it's like, okay, well, this is going to (laughs) be, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So, you know, lifting up houses, that is, a, I think, a fairly common thing before. But I haven't heard of anyone moving it into the backyard, which is which is what... Usually they just lift it up and, and do their work underneath, you know, yeah. but maybe just the way where they are, that's the way they do things down there. I don't know. It could be very yeah. by region. They had space in the backyard and they wanted to completely redo the basement. So that's what they did. Like it was, there's a whole episode, episode two, I think, where... They, it took, takes them two days to do that, like the first day to kind of jack up the house, oh. and then the second day to to slide it into the backyard on these massive. I've got to watch that. I, that, that yeah, that, it's I, fascinating. I like that that's cool. Absolutely fascinating. So it's on the PBS Television Network if you get that. But they also have an app, which is probably available 
worldwide. And so the first four or five episodes are, are out now. They put in, uh, it was, the basement was precast concrete slabs as well. So they moved it into the backyard and then they bought it, brought in these giant slabs uh, with a crane and th they're precast in a factory and they just, that's the walls of the foundation. They just slide them into place. Why? Why, why would they do it that way? I, I don't see much of an advantage. It seemed to be fairly quick, so maybe that's why. But yeah, it was all these precast walls. And then they had to cut sort of slots in them because, of course, they have to bring the house back and put it back on the foundation. But it's being carried on all of these steel girders. So they have to cut all these notches into these foundations so that it can plop back down where the steel girders are. And then they take the girders out and then they somehow fill up those holes. They didn't really explain how they fill up the holes, but... Yeah, just when I thought it was not going to be as elaborate as last season, absolutely crazy. Wow, I have to watch that. You know, I knew a guy who's now deceased who did insulated concrete form houses, where yeah. you have this, you know, large styrofoam form and you fill it with concrete yeah. and there's a boot bar concrete. right there. That was interesting because it had, yeah. you know, concrete's not insulated well by itself, but, you know, with, with that, how do they insulate rammed earth houses? Like I, I. I would think that's better than concrete because there's only a little bit of concrete in it and it doesn't transfer the heat as much, but is yeah, it just you, the dirt or? You put, there... No, you put rigid foam insulation in the middle of the wall. Oh, in the you middle have, of the wall. Yeah. I have mentioned that before. That's a, that's the change for a cold climate like Canada is you leave a gap in the middle and that's where the rigid foam insulation goes. And you pound around it, you stamp, you compress the, the material around it. Yeah, that. I probably, cause it's rigid. I, I assume it can take the, or you leave a space and then you slip it in. I'm not, I'm not sure, but so other than the foundation, so the, this old house project, the new one, so far there's nothing super clean energy, but they are putting heat pumps on the second floor. So they're kind of expanding the second floor by putting in a dormer that makes the roof higher. And so they're reusing their old gas furnace, but there was previously no heating at all on the top floor because it was kind of like an attic. So they're putting a couple of wall mount heat pumps on the top floor and, and that mounts it. And then the whole house is going to be like 10 feet higher. Like they're, they're, the foundation is going to make the whole house higher. So they're going to have not just a larger basement, but one that's kind of like farther well, above the surface. I think, so you, the, I think the older like houses didn't have much for basements. In my old neighborhood, which was a wartime yeah. neighborhood and the few houses that were, you know, 20 years older than that, 20 years older than World War II, I had an A-frame wartime house, which they built for soldiers in Canada. They're quite common in that area of neighborhoods that are that old. It was efficiently done. I remember if you've mentioned the efficiency of using the materials because the, the, they didn't use as much to make that. And yet there was like a thousand and twenty five square feet or something like that. When I was doing that, there was another A-frame, you know, wartime house, as we call them down the street, getting jacked up and they put a basement in and it is much higher. It's like, cause I think, you know, my basement is barely over six feet cause they made people shorter back then for one, <laughs> yeah. and they didn't really use the basements or I, I just had a crawl space, but I use, it was a full standing crawl space where the furnace was and a water heater. Anyway, yeah, they, they were doing that in my neighborhood a lot that when they replaced the basements, they were making the houses higher so that that space was usable. You know, I'm, I'm not a huge basement fan because of, you know, yeah, dankness and cold, yeah. unless it has in-floor piped heating, you know, like that radiate, radiate, radiant floor heating that, that goes upwards. It's really yeah. hard to make them warm. Like the, the air goes up high and you're freezing on your couch, watching your big screen TV. Back in the day. Yeah. But had, if it, it helps if you can make them higher, taller, and insulate them well, then they're absolutely usable and not so dang. Yeah. And insulate the floor as well. So, but they still flood. There was flooding around here. We were voting in the provincial election yesterday in a church that was on the low part of our neighborhood. And, and we said, yeah, it kind of smells dank in here. And I said, oh yeah, it flooded. I remember it flooded not that long ago, a couple of years ago yeah. during a thunderstorm. So I don't know. It looked nice. We were talking about your friend Barry last week, who has a dual access solar tracker, and we pondered, this is, this is like a, a rack of solar panels on a pole, and that rack can tilt to follow the sun north and south in winter, because it's at a different angle to get the optimal angle, but it also follows it during the day. It'll uh, go to the east and follow the sun across the sky, and it'll know what time of year it is, what angle to be at, and all that. 
And we were pondering, how much does that improve efficiency? Well, I looked it up. It's 40%, which is really good yeah, compared to that's great. an optimal fixed solar system. So he, his was like, what, 10 kilowatts? That's yeah. what it's rated at its peak. So you can basically say that that's going to do about four, you know, 14 kilowatts of what... Uh, a, a stationary. Yeah. So that should cover a vehicle. I know he's out of town and he does lots of driving to get places, but he's, it's a commute for him, but still, you know, it's, you gotta get an electric car. You gotta, you gotta, yeah. you gotta Barry. Come on, <laughs> come on, Barry. Speaking of people, Jim Farley is driving a Chinese EV. This is something I was talking about last week as well. This is kind of some updates to our last week's show. I forgot to mention that he's been driving a Chinese made EV for the last six months and he says he loves it. And the reason he does that is he drives the competition to get, you know, you can't just tear it apart. He said, you, you need to live with it. And that's what he's doing. He's living with a Chinese made EV, uh, trying to get to know the competition. And last week we were talking about how you came back from a trip and you were using full self-driving on the highway for in your Tesla. I wanted to mention and remind people that other car companies have that tech as well. Because, you know, when I talk to people, they don't know that. They think it's Tesla and only yeah, Tesla. yeah. You know, I'm never getting in a Tesla. It's going to drive itself into a wall. Well, every car company basically has it. It's Blue Cruise for Ford, which works very well. Super Cruise for GM and Chevy vehicles, right? Because they pre-map areas with LiDAR, and it, you can't go on a highway that's not pre-mapped. And they've actually mapped quite a few of the highways, even where we live. And, you know, other vehicles as well. Mercedes has a good one. They're all competing, but they do the same thing. They, uh, they do highway driving without, you know, yeah. any attention really. You just have to look at the road and it'll measure your eyes in, in some cases. And that's even available on my Bolt and certain models of my Bolt. People were buying that. It's called Super Cruise and you have to pay a monthly subscription and you have to buy the uh, upper trim level of the model, but people seem to love it in the Bolt forums that I've been reading. Yeah, and it seems to be the easier problem to solve in terms of self-driving. So, yeah, I know I've used, like, lane keep assist. And, and I would be a bit nervous them. on a two-lane highway. You were on a divided highway, but, yeah, you know, because yeah. if it takes, you know, decides to go, oh, I'm going to go into the other car, and boom, you're dead. Or the truck that's coming the other way. But, yeah, I mean, if you, when you're passing vehicles, which is not all the time necessarily on a two-lane highway, you could maybe just keep your hand right on the wheel yeah. and prevent it from doing anything crazy not that they do but you'd worry that it would you know yeah one mistake and you're done well sure and and none of them is perfect and there's going to continue to be accidents involved with all this kind of tech but it's important to remember that humans are terrible drivers and human drivers have been killing other people for a hundred years now and it's time that we moved on to something better definitely so my daughters got this teacher at school like i drop her off a couple days a week and there's a Hyundai Ionic 5 in the parking lot, which is different, you know. It, it's, it's great to, to go to a place and do something you're doing and see how the world is changing because now the teachers have a couple of EVs in the parking yeah. lots, even here in our backwards place, which I'll talk a lot about later. It's, yeah, I was disappointed to hear because my daughter's been chatting him up. She's an EV advocate in, her, in the making, and she's been chatting him up, and apparently he bought it last summer. There was four on the lot, and then there was two, and then he thought, well, I better jump on that. He's a farmer, by the way. He, he lives outside, so he's one of these people who probably thinks, you know, I've got the commute, let's, let's lower my, my monthly gas bill by getting electric. Yeah. But then he was going to go to Vancouver for a vacation shortly after he bought it, and to my extreme disappointment, he got to the next city an hour away, Moose Jaw, and he turned around. He gave up. He got scared. Yeah. Because I faced that same situation two years ago in my slow charging bolt, which is not the same at anything near his Ionic 6, which has a longer range and charges capably very fast. He started, I think he encountered a broken charger in Moose Jaw, which there was a lot at the time. And maybe he claims he researched it, but he got looking at all the broken chargers on the route and turned around and took a pickup truck or his SUV or something. Yeah. And that's very disappointing to me. I, I wish that yeah. he called me. He doesn't know me, but I yeah. wish he, I, I should have a red phone in my bedroom that just lights up with people in need because you could have done it, sir. Yeah. You could have done it. Easily. But you also and You would have been very happy like me. I was thrilled that I did it because it was beautiful in the mountains and half my electricity was free. You recapped 
your research on that, and it was extensive. So I do kind of understand why someone might give up. You, you know, you really, it, it was a I lot of research. I almost did. I was teetering. Yeah. Like, you even were teetering. the morning we left, and I'm so glad. Because you know what? I've said it before. I don't think my SUV would have made some of those climbs on the mountains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the electric car, you tap the pedal, it takes you where you want to go. No effort, no noise. It just does it without effort. But my SUV, which is aged, it's long, very long of the tooth, it could have broken down. We could still be there, you know, living in the mountains, fighting <laughs> bears for berries or something, for all I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my uh, partner's uh, co-worker, who's retired recently, she used to own a Mini Cooper, cool little car from Britain, right? Yeah, but the gasoline version? Gasoline version, but then she wanted to get an electric one, because they're very cool. They've been around for a long time. Yeah. Uh, you can occasionally see one around here. People have been importing them for the United States. She tried to get one, and then the dealership said, no, nah, we can't get them anymore. Sorry, you can't get them. So yeah. she bought the gas version. And then a couple of weeks later, sure enough, the EV version came on. So it's, it's a really, this is something they do all the time. They don't want to sell EVs. They don't want to sell them. And they want to get you into the gas car, and they, and, and, this poor woman was, had the wool pulled over her eyes and got taken advantage of. And I hate that. I hate it. Yeah. And they want to sell you whatever is on the lot. That's the most convenient for them. So that's what they try to do. Yeah. And it didn't work out. She's pissed off and she would have loved it. She would have absolutely loved it because she had the exact same car. The electric version would have blown her mind. There was a one-to-one -one comparison and she would have seen all the great things that it is to own an EV. This is from... The Canadian Chevrolet Equinox EV group on Facebook says, Today I noticed Canada Post delivering my mail with an Equinox EV. The Canada Post is our national letter carrier, and it was uh, an LHD version. There was a second person in the car. This is rural mail delivery in eastern Ontario. So they had a person driving and a person putting the mail in the, the little uh, rural mailboxes. And somebody else said that uh, there are many in Quebec with one driver. So that's cool to see Canada Post is actually, and they're not doing it with trucks. They're doing it just with a small SUV. All-wheel drive, I assume. Nicely into the next story, which is Louisville, Colorado. Not Kentucky, Louisville, Colorado. It is kind of a small city. I looked it up. It's sort of like a bedroom community for Denver. So only about 20,000 people, and it's only four trucks. But this makes it the first all-electric garbage truck fleet in America. So with four trucks, they can do the whole city. And, you know, uh, garbage trucks is a perfect use case for electric, you know, package delivery, letter delivery, that kind of thing as well, where you're stopping a lot. So you don't have to run your diesel engine all the time while you're just sitting there idling. So it's stop and go. You don't usually do, you know, more than a hundred miles on a route, per, you know, usually in something like that. So yeah, they have four of these trucks. They're from McNeilis and Volterra. So when my garbage truck comes, you can hear it, I, I think, a block and a half away, right? At least. Because it's just the, the big, they just floor the diesel engine and it just grinds away in, yeah. in gear one and then they hit the brakes and the brakes are squeaking. With this, you have electric. It just pushes you forward, heavy or not. It's got all that torque there. Then the regenerative braking will pull you to a stop for the most part. It's a perfect use case for something like that, because like you said, it's at most 100 miles in a day in a driving, and the stop-start is, is just perfect for something like this. Yeah, and you don't really use any energy when the truck is stopped, like virtually no energy, so it's, you know, totally perfect. And you're gaining back some of the energy that you use to push from one stop to the next. You're gaining a percentage of that back with your regenerative braking charging the battery. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Brian, it's time for me to get outraged again. It's a oh, no. It's a favorite aspect of our show. Yesterday, we had an election in our Canadian province of Saskatchewan. And uh, did you vote? Uh, yes, I did. Did you vote in advance? Did you vote on the day? In advance, yeah. They had the polls open for a whole week, which was very nice. I never got around to it until the last day. Then I went there and voted, and yeah. So I've been struggling with their platform. So we've got two main parties here. We've got a right-wing conservative party called the Saskatchewan Party. We've got another party called the uh, NDP, which are quite different than other NDPs in other parts of the country. The federal and the BC NDPs are a little bit more 
left to center. This one's kind of gravitating towards centrist populist trying to, because we live in a very right-wing rural province, half the ridings and, you know, that's, this is what happened. Everyone in the, in the conservative rural ridings, which don't believe in climate change, their government officially came out and said it's hoo-ha. And it's very frustrating because we're not doing a lot to mitigate climate change, but we're also an oil and gas province and we're not doing a lot to prepare for what's coming. Anyone who listens to this show knows what's coming. It's a question of when, not if, and it's sooner than later. I mean, oil prices are lower than what they thought the floor would be of $80. They're now 72, I think, last time I checked, and they could go lower. It's going to be a tough year for oil revenues, so that affects our revenues as one of the major you know, drivers of our budget for a provincial government. I got a lot of flack from my son when I said I wasn't going to vote for that one of those two parties, the, the, the NDP. Because one party is using uh, trans issues to get, you know, fight off the smaller far right parties to get them to vote for them. And they're just dog whistling a bunch of crap. And that's been, you know, nasty social conservatism going on. And I, you know, I, he said, you know, you got to vote for those people. And I said, well, I'm voting for not just those kids, but I'm voting for all kids because they don't have a great climate hall. So they don't talk about it. It's a, a small paragraph in their, in their, you know, in their platform. So I went looking at other parties, and I did end up voting Green. The Green is a bunch of misfits and, and, and people they just sort of collect off the streets and make them candidates in most of the writings. If you look at the election results on TV, and every time they have a picture of a Green person, you, my wife and I were laughing <laughs> because they're just kind of <laughs> not your typical politician. And it also, could have been you. It could, could have been, been me, him. and it maybe should have been me, but. There's another party here that people associate with the Liberal Party coming out of the fire. It's called the SAS Progress Party. I read their platform. Have you even heard of them? No. I don't think most people have. They, had, they ran three candidates. And I will say this, all the candidates had pictures. You know, some of these other far-right parties didn't even have pictures. They didn't, couldn't bother to be photographed. Maybe there was a paranoia that the, you know, George Soros would come for them if they had their picture up somewhere. The Saskatchewan Progress Party says it would raise oil and gas and coal royalty rates by 10%. That is bold. That's somebody after my heart because Norway yeah. had higher royalty rates on their stuff and now they're, they're living large because, yeah. you know, for 30, 40 years, they, they brought in more money. Here, we're like giving them, you know, discounts and, and subsidies. Yeah, the Canadian provinces tend to compete with each other for this kind of thing, so... You know, if you want the oil and gas companies to set up in your province and not the one next door, you offer them a better rate. And this ends up with not as much revenue as we should be getting for ruining the planet like we're doing. Now, it would also, this party would also support rare earth element initiatives. That is, you know, battery mineral mining. They're thinking of that. They're thinking of the future through tax incentives and up to 50% funding for new ventures in exchange for an ownership stake. Interesting. It's kind of controversial what thing to do around here to, for the government to take ownership and things, because it hasn't worked out in the past and decades ago. The party would also bring back the Saskatchewan Transportation Company and build a high-speed passenger rail system, which I disagree with because I don't think that it in in a future of robo taxis, I think you yeah know, we could have a one of those te Tesla like bus things with twenty people driving itself from city to city for a very low fee, and I. I can you compare that to rail that goes maybe twice as fast, not even twice as fast. It's probably like a little bit faster than a car. Um, I, I love high-speed rail, but we maybe don't have the population to support it here. Maybe next century, but not now. So that's, and it, I, I like high-speed rail, but look at California. It's such a terribly expensive and difficult thing to do. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. But they are and recently announced that, you know, they've leaked it to the media that they are going to do something between Toronto and Quebec City in Canada. Yeah, it's a five and a half hour drive and it'll cut that almost in half. But why not just a regular train? You remember when we used to have the uh, Dayliner yeah. train go to yeah. Saskatoon between two yeah. cities? I love it. That, and make it just a bit nicer <laughs> and maybe make some, just some, some ways to make it faster, like some crossings that would go up. You know, they'd have to put in electronic crossings at some places so that when it's going over a gravel road, maybe at a high, higher speed instead of slowing down, 
And uh, it also doubles SAS power, solar, wind, and power generation. Eh, okay, you just lost me. <laughs> How about uh, 10 times in it? Yeah. yeah. Well, they have the right idea. The thing is, the party that is center-left that I have supported in the past doesn't do squat. They, they say that climate change is real and we will support stuff and that's it because it's all they're willing to talk about. Well, an ex-MLA, this is kind of, if you're in the States and most of our listeners are, it's like a, a state representative. An MLA is like a state representative. So a uh, yeah, podcast came out by friend of the show and acquaintance of mine, Paul DeShane, the Saskatchewan Survivor's Guide podcast, where they talked to former NDP center-left MP Kathy Spruill. And yes, she's retired, but she got talky. She got, uh, let some things out and supposedly center left, but more and more, like I said, populist center <laughs> still, the, you know, right wingers will call them communists. Like average people, I'm sure I have neighbors who refer to the NDP as communists. And there's a link to that podcast and episode. If you're a local and are interested in that, she said she went into politics concerned about climate change and that it was a motivator because she thought she could do her best as an opposition party to push government to do more on climate. She says it became very clear very quickly that politics was not going to be a place where these changes were going to happen. I went into politics concerned about climate change. That was yeah. my main motivator, thinking that, you know, we would do our best as an opposition to push the government to do, to do more, to prevent, you know, anthropogenic change. And it became very clear very quickly that politics was not going to be the place where that changes was going to happen. So. She became cynical. She went into it positive about it and then became quite cynical. She brought up uh, something called the Leap Manifesto. This is a five-page document created by a husband and wife that was discussed by the party in 2016, and it freaked people out. The doc. This, this is a, an Eastern Canada, you know, the husband is a, is a filmmaker, Avi Lewis. Yeah, Avi Lewis and his partner came out with this document, and it was debated in political circles, at least by the left of center political circles. And the document calls for a total move to renewable energy by 2050. Some characterize the manifesto as a demand to leave oil in the ground. And, uh, you know, I, I was very quickly, as the environment critic, I was expected to say that I loved oil and gas production because it was so important to the Saskatchewan economy. And that was very difficult for me on a personal level because that's that wasn't where I wanted to see things go forward. I mean, I, she said she was told that she has, as the environmentalist, has to love oil and gas because that was important to our economy, and she's come out and said that. And this is all because they got freaked out by this document. But Avi Lewis, the filmmaker husband who co-authored it, told CBC Radio that's not in the manifesto. The document, he says, proposes no new fossil fuel infrastructure, which is an offensive thing to say. In these yeah. parts, they want to build pipelines for oil that's going to flow forever. To where, to whom, I don't know. So this former MLA, Ms. Spruill, says it was uh, freaked a lot of people out. Now she says they're basically afraid of it. I don't know. Afraid of it. And out of that meeting came this document, which we called the Leap Manifesto. And what, you know, what it does is it maps out how we can transition away from fossil fuels very rapidly in line with both, with what scientists are telling us we must do and what engineers are telling us we now can do. That, that was from 10 years ago when they had that document, and it set the tone for Prairie Canada's energy policy, and it's just bogus crap, because the reality is that. It is that. This is the uh, UN General Secretary. The science is clear. The 1.5 degree limit is only possible if we ultimately stop burning all fossil fuels. Not reduce, not abate, phase out with a clear time frame aligned with 1.5 degrees. Allow me to have a message for fossil fuel company leaders. Your old role is rapidly aging. Do not double down on an obsolete business model. Lead the transition to renewables. Make no mistake, the road to climate sustainability is also the only viable pathway to economic sustainability of your companies in the future. So the general secretary is saying you cannot burn oil and gas when we have this climate crisis, right? Well, 
He's telling them to get into a different business. Our government should be getting into a different business. This is some serious things that no one seems to be taking seriously around here. And Brian, it's twofold. It's not only our moral obligation to do this, obviously. I mean, we're not going to change climate one way or another, but we have to do our part and because we're the biggest emitter in Canada and we're doing squat. Now, there's also the issue of preparing our province for a transition that these assholes don't think is coming. They just want to think that everything's going to be fine and our province, you know, oil prices at some point, the demand is going to level off. And when the demand levels off and starts to recede slightly, the prices are going to dr dramatically, you know, there's ups and downs, there's all kinds of factors. There's wars, there's everything else, there's the supply and demand. But generally speaking, the Saudis are probably going to sell as much oil as they can at that point, and prices are going to go down into the basement. They're already low. They're already lo below the $80 a barrel basement that they thought that they had. Well, it's 72 today, and it's predicted to be a tough year. But she says, until it's the number one issue for voters, politics will not respond. That's what she's saying. It's not the number one issue of voters anywhere except a few tiny island nations that are literally sinking because of climate change. That's the only place that's the number one issue. She makes allusions to Europe. Well, they've done a bit better than us. No, they've done a f of a lot better than us. They've done literally 25,000 times more solar in the Netherlands than we have, and they have two-thirds the solar potential we have. Pick up a newspaper. Pick up a business newspaper and read what's going on around the world. You have no f***ing clue what's going on anywhere. Come on, people. So our province is going to go down to shitter because we're not doing anything. We think everything's going to be fine, and it's not. Politicians aren't going to be able to deal with it because they won't win, she said. Well, that's true, but you have to be courageous. You have to tell people what the issue is. You can't just respond to whatever's on their mind. Cost of living. Oh, things are so expensive post-COVID. Because my groceries are 10 cents higher and everyone's backing away from the carbon pricing because they think that that's the cause because right-wing politicians told them and then finally prices went up for other reasons. Well, you got to tell them. you got to educate them. People are stupid. You have to be the smart people. You have to be the influencers. You have to be the TikTokers of the political arenas that you're in. And she pointed out that other politicians are struggling. No, they're not. They're actually doing things, courageous things, even though it's not the number one issue. It's three, four, five in some places, and people are doing, even the United States is doing something. The, the, the United States that gets clobbered by hurricanes, they don't think climate change is real. Half the people don't. Half the people think they're old, Earth, Earth is flat down there. And yet, they got together and they did. The biggest climate package legislation in history was passed by friend of the show Joe Biden just recently, a, a couple of years ago. So, yeah, it doesn't make anything. And it's, it, the, it gets worse. We tried to talk about good news on the show. I think it's time we, we had some, some, you know, coming to a realization of what's really going on. There are some struggles with the world, and we can't fool around. We do have to stop burning fossil fuels. And it can't be an individual choice. It has to be government policy. You have to have the courage to educate people and to push towards doing the right thing. And you also have to prepare, if you're a petrol province like us, to get your act together and prepare for a future where oil is not going to dominate. There are other forms of energy, and we have access to it. We have the best sun and wind. It's been said a thousand times. Let's do something about it. Let's make some money off of it. Let's lower electricity bills. So I'll leave you with this, Brian. This is Dave from YouTube's Just Have a Think. It's a popular podcast. A lot of our listeners have mentioned it to me on the show to say, you know, check it out, and I've already been listening to it. This is him talking about the latest report on ocean currents. A thousand years, still too far away to bother you? Well, how about something a bit close to home then? Hundreds of billions of tons of land-based ice going into the water every year is making a region of the North Atlantic less salty. And that, combined with some other climate-related phenomena, is causing the famous Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, to slow down. The last time I took a look at this science of that mechanism, only about two years ago, the consensus seemed to be that the AMOC would be still going strong throughout the rest of this century. But the very latest research is suggesting the system might collapse as early as 2037, or only 12 years from now. And in those circumstances, to paraphrase Rudyard Kipling, 
If you can keep your head while all those around you are losing theirs, then you probably haven't understood the seriousness of the situation. And you probably haven't understood the seriousness of the situation. And you probably have probably have a probably have a serious situation. And you probably have a serious situation. 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 So, and I know that you're going to have to edit in all those bleeps, but they're, we're important for you to get off of your chest, I think. So, you know, you'll go through the extra effort of having to bleep out those words. I will. I mean, I, I've been wondering about why they haven't done it. They come out and they said it. They come out and admitted exactly what they were thinking. And it's, it's frustrating to hear it. Yeah. We're in a climate emergency and the best that our local opposition party can come up with is basically a don't ask, don't tell policy. It's just don't talk about it. It seemed to be what they've settled on. Okay. So we're going to move on now to, uh, this is from Energy News Network. We talked about Hurricane Helene on the show. This was a large U.S. hurricane that disrupted things to say the least. This was a very, very massive disaster. But there's this great story from Energy News Network, Solar Microgrids, and a nonprofit organization called The Footprint Project. This is a fairly new organization, but they get together and they try and replace, uh, you know, diesel generators in these kinds of disaster areas with solar and batteries. So just to, to quote from the article here, noisy generators powering trailers where Asheville residents sought showers weeks after the city's water system failed. They fueled food trucks, all these noisy generators, delivering hot meals to thousands of people that didn't have working stoves. And they filtered water for communities to drink from and to flush toilets. And then this New Orleans-based nonprofit is working to displace as many of these fossil fuel burners as they can, swapping in batteries and solar panels instead. So this so far is the largest response effort from the Footprint Project in only a couple of years. It's uh, to quote here from the organization, responders use what they know works. And our job is to get them stuff that works better than single-use fossil fuels do. And then they can start asking for that. Instead, it triples, trickles up to a systems change. The rationale for diesel and gas generators is very simple. They're widely available. They're relatively easy to operate, and assuming the fuel is available, they can run 24-7, keeping people warm, fed, and connected to their loved ones. But, of course, there's downsides. Burning fossil fuel not just causes more carbon that exacerbates the climate crisis, but fog and soot-forming air pollutants that can trigger asthma attacks and uh, other respiratory problems. In Puerto Rico, after Hurricane Maria, generators were so prevalent after the electric grid failed, that harmful air pollution in San Juan soared above the legal limit. And I believe we talked about that at the time. There were challenges firsthand. So the spokesperson from this organization was in Guinea in 2016, responding to an Ebola outbreak as a paramedic. And his job was to train the locals to collect blood samples and store them in a generator-powered refrigerator that could then be motorcycled to another city for testing. And he had a grant to give cash reimbursements for this fuel to get these blood samples and, and do this work. And he says, this is so hard already. The idea of doing a cash reimbursement in a super poor rural area for gas generators seems really hard. And he recalled thinking, I had heard of solar refrigerators and I asked the local logician in Konarki, are these things even possible? And the next day the person came back and said, yes, these Solar refrigerators are absolutely possible and could be installed within a month. And it was such a no-brainer, he said. The only reason we hadn't done it that way is that the grant wasn't written that way. And we talked about this recently on the show. There's all kinds of subsidies for company cars in Europe. And it tends to work better for fossil fuel cars for some reason. And so I thought that was a great example of how you know, we just have to change our thinking around these things. And it's just the way it had been done previously was all about, you know, using a grant to buy fossil fuels to do things. But then they realized that there's a better way. So 
two years later, the Footprint Project is now responding. This is the biggest deployment that they've had. And they deploy, they deploy solar-powered charging stations, water filtration systems, and other climate tech. They start with those without power, water, or a generator at all, and then eventually extending to those looking to offset their fossil fuel combustion. So the group has now built 50 such solar-powered microgrids in the region, and you know more than it has ever dis- supplied in the past. The recipients range from volunteer fire stations to trailer parks to an art collective. So they basically work with whoever they can to just gather up the materials. They look for people willing to donate and help with solar panels, with batteries, and they put all of these things together. And, you know, they start with those most in need, but then they can start to switch some of these things that are being powered, like food trucks, with diesel. They can move in and even if only covers it during the daytime, at least they don't have to run the diesel generators uh, 24-7. So yeah, I thought that was a really good news project. It's just one of those things that's going to have to become more institutionalized. Like right now, the default is diesel and gas generators, but you know, eventually, and there's going to be lots of climate disasters in the future, the default eventually is going to have to switch to you know solar and batteries. And with the recent hurricanes, we had problems with people needing gas to get their generation, their generators going, and they weren't able to in some cases. Sometimes they run out. And sometimes you had to wait for hours uh, standing up with your jerry can to get gas. So that was a problem. And yeah, I another thing that I wanted to mention from last week's show is we were talking about how some people are using their 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 EVs to charge, power their home. And, you know, basically they put an inverter from the hardware store on their 12-volt battery and then the big traction battery, not the little one, but the huge expensive one that moves the car would top up that battery constantly. And that battery would feed, you know, a thousand Watts or something into your house. And I was wondering how, cause somebody said that they did run an, an air window air conditioner in their bedroom. And I thought, well, how'd you do that? But I, I forgot that they actually bought a device, basically a battery you know, Anchor and other people sell them. They're, they're about the size of a bread maker or smaller, and they're all lithium battery, and they all, if you, if you top that up, it can take the bigger load when the air conditioner kicks on because that fridge and our air conditioner takes more, you know, from the top up when it just starts the compressor and then it goes down. So you have to meet that max of when it kicks in, when the compressor kicks in and either of those two things. And this battery sort of ate up that extra current that wouldn't be available from the car and would have tripped off the inverter on the car. So those were about $1,000 US, but they also use them as battery backup as well, because it was like a kilowatt of almost a half kilowatt of electricity or something like that. Yeah, well, like some car charging stations that have batteries built into them because it helps to offset those peak demand periods. Right. And... Yeah, no matter what, if you live in a hurricane zone, it's a handy thing to have if you can afford it, because it will keep your phones charged without even touching your car, and it will keep, I don't know how much it'll keep going, but it'll keep a few things going. So it's an interesting story. Now I'm going to get to some listener mail here, if you don't mind. Let's dip into the mailbag. It says, our first letter is from Claude in Lethbridge, Alberta. I had to ask him where he's from, and here's why. (laughs) He says, hey guys, love the podcast. Just wanted to let you know, you guys, that preceding the intro to your podcast, episode 234, that is our last week's episode, there was a United Conservative Party attack ad. This is Alberta right-wing politics. He's living in the province of Alberta, and he got a political ad from there, dissing the person on the center-left who was running and our centrist, Justin Trudeau, who is the current Prime Minister of Canada, may not be for long and talking about anti-carbon tax rhetoric. In other words, didn't want to hear that. (laughs) Not sure if there's something you could do about that, but I find it kind of funny. So do I, because they're giving us money. Don't know what audience they're trying to reach, but uh, yeah, I I had the option of turning off political ads, and I thought, well, what political ads are we going to (laughs) get? Now I know, and I can't find a way to turn it off now. So uh, I will continue trying. And yeah. I, I don't know that I'll be successful. Yeah. So this is through our, our podcast server system. We're, we're now serving ads onto the podcast. But the organization I mean, advertised cast through yeah. Whipson. 
the good news, it was probably a waste of the money of the United Universe. What is it? The United Conservative Party. Yeah. It was hopefully wasting their money because I think this is the wrong audience for that ad. So that's the good news. But I would certainly prefer that that garbage was uh, kept off our podcast somehow. <laughs> that's for sure. I don't know what art is to try to reach. I also want to wish you good luck, Saskatchewan, in the upcoming election. Well, it didn't work out, buddy. It didn't no. work out removing this detrimental crass party. Well, another five years. If anyone has a home in Honolulu or possibly Colorado, I don't know. Where, where's a right. refuge? Probably not. We'll see how the U.S. election goes. And Claude is, I believe, from Quebec, currently living in Lethbridge, Alberta, working. Thank you, Claude, for reaching out to us. I appreciate that. And I apologize for the bad ads. That I, if anyone else is getting bad ads like that, you know, I, I've heard it with uh, like a North uh, Austin Nissan ad, which is a long ways here. Not as far as the South Austin Nissan. Yeah. It's a bit further. So maybe that makes sense. But it's... Yeah, it's, they're just trying to understand our, our listeners and maybe it'll get better as we go along. Or you can get by those ads by subscribing on your podcast app, $1.99, or supporting us on Patreon. You get ad-free episodes. Well, again, I apologize. Really neat story about slowing carbon from entering the atmosphere with biochar, says Derek. I'm curious about the difference, the material, different ways that material can be used. Okay, what's biochar? This is from Wikipedia. It is defined by the International Biochar Initiative. There's an initiative. <laughs> as the solid material obtained from the thermal chemical conversion of biomass in an oxygen-limited environment. So what they do is they burn it without a lot of oxygen. They heat it, and it, it goes through a chemical transformation, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, let a lot of carbon back into the atmosphere. I think half of it is as yeah. much. Normally, when you burn wood, it releases all the carbon into the atmosphere because a tree grows and it absorbs carbon as it grows. And then when it's burned, it's released. So this is a way to keep the carbon in the sort of char that's left over afterwards. So Derek sent us a link from Minnesota Public Radio. I think that'll be in your show notes. And I've also looked around and saw that there was a link on the National Forest Service in the United States. Biochar is a carbon-rich soil amendment created by burning wood waste with special equipment at a relatively low temperature, increasing wood waste, uh, you know, so down trees, logs, branches, keeps them from being a fire hazard because they're already burnt. If you've ever tried to uh, put out a fire in your fire pit or something like that, that's kind of what's left over is half burnt stuff. And, you know, that can go into the soil. So wood waste left over from timber or fuel reduction projects known as slash is typically piled and burned under favorable conditions. This practice reduces excess fuels and can otherwise feed wildland fires. You know, these fuels, they, they could feed a, a, a wildfire pretty easily, but if they're half burnt and they generate a lot of smoke, when they are normally burnt, this generates less smoke. I think we talked about this before. And burn scars that impact soil productivity allow weeds to invade. So yeah, this is able to keep the ecosystem running by doing this. In a standard slash pile burning, 90 to 94% of the stored carbon is turned into carbon dioxide, a significant contributor to climate change. And depending on the method of biochar creation, only 50% of the stored carbon is turned into carbon dioxide. And when the biochar is applied to the soil, it can ultimately be carbon negative compared to burning or natural bio mass decomposition because of its greater stability and high carbon content. And I've got a link to the U.S. For Forest Service article on that. Thank you for contacting us. Please uh, get a hold of us anytime you like. We are on Patreon. We are on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Where aren't we, Brian? Yeah, lots uh, of places. Cleanenergyshowgmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. Join our community on Patreon for free access and additional content. Access to all of our Patreon members, including Damon Cornelius from Australia this week, is getting his episodes in advance commercial free. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon, Damon, and everyone else. Thank you for supporting us on Apple Podcasts as well. As well, anyone who wants to get something in return immediately, a product, you can go to the Clean Energy Store linked in your show notes and order something there, and we get a few bucks from that. Uh, all right, this is from Electric, the world's first ever electric hydrofoil ferry service. So this is in Sweden. 
It's about a 15 kilometer or nine mile ferry ride. And it takes about 30 minutes and it's done with a hydrofoil electric ferry. So it's on the small side as far as ferries go. Looks like it will seat, you know, 20 or 30 people or whatever. But yeah, this is the Candela company. They're one of the new companies that's trying to exploit this hydrofoil technology in boats. And so this is now in operation in Sweden and a hydrofoil boat rides above the water with wings that are below the surface and you end up with a much smoother, more efficient boat ride. You can avoid a lot of the waves by doing it this way. You and need one of those super... for the cottage. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You're talking about things that you need to install when you, like, like electrical outlets by your toilet for your bidet, which I demand yeah. you get. You need, a, you need one for your hydrofoil too on the dock. Yeah. I need a high-speed charger for my hydrofoil boat that I would eventually get at our cottage. But yeah, so it's, it's a really energy efficient way of doing boats. And, you know, there is a large, you know, marine transit system in Sweden and in many countries. And according to the article, you know, it takes way more resources than you would think. You know, it doesn't move that many passengers, but if you're using fossil fuels, it's, it's burning a lot of them. So switching to electric ferries, obviously great way to go. Yeah. And I'm uh, speaking of Vancouver, where we, I was last, I guess a couple of summers ago already, the ferry service there, because Vancouver Island is a major destination. They have large, large ferries steaming ahead, carrying a lot of people, a lot of cars, and you can't even get on one. You have to wait for days to get on one. And uh, that's just the way it is. And coming up next, people, it's the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest news in clean energy and transportation from the past week. Congressional districts that favored Trump in the 2020 election received three times as much clean energy and manufacturing investments as those that favored Biden. This is noteworthy because... Zero Republicans voted for the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. Louisville, Colorado, launches its first electric garbage truck fleet, which we've covered. But there's a link there at the bottom of your show notes if you want to check that out. Bloomberg, BNEF analysts anticipate that more sectors will decarbonize via electrification rather than hydrogen. That's because electrification costs are falling faster and hydrogen costs are not dropping as expected previously. The first Costco-branded DC fast chargers have built-in batteries, something you were just mentioning, Brian. They go, they're fast charging too, like uh, fairly fast. Now, here's what I think. You go to Costco, you spend an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two hours if you, if you sample the, the, the food. You don't need that fast of charging. You put in yeah. more 50 kilowatt chargers. This is where it would take you an hour. And they cost a lot less and the grid demand is less and, you know, Unless they're on the highway, then people are just stopping and it's a convenience. But if you're a Costco, uh, I assume they're just for Costco people because that's how they do things usually. Yeah, I guess there could just be sometimes confusion. Then people have to kind of remember, okay, which are the 50 kilowatt, which are the 300 ones, you know, like the Tesla chargers are basically all the same. Like some of them are 150 and some are 250, but you never have to remember kind of which charger to use depending on your use case. But this is a destination. This is kind of a different thing. A shopping mall, grocery stores, movie theaters, places where you spend some time. I'm saying, hey, you know, it's put more of them up, serve more people and, and spend less money. Or maybe you can just split the costs, you know, split the, the power between them. Some of them do that anyway. Already today with the current electricity mix in the United Kingdom, heat pumps reduce fossil fuel consumption four times compared to gas boilers. This is with a energy mix that's only going to get cleaner. All energy mixes are getting cleaner in the world, right? All of them, even ours. So yeah, and heat pumps generally are cheaper to operate in most places except where we live because it's insanely cold. It's time for a CES fast fact from Oxfam, Canada. Billionaires emit more carbon pollution in 90 minutes than the average person does in a lifetime. <laughs> oh, to be a wow. billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The new solar array on the roof of University of Pittsburgh dorm can generate enough electricity, enough energy to power half the building. 
So yeah, why not? Why not? Yep. That's from the Post Gazette. Pollutants from fossil gas stoves kill 40,000 Europeans each year. A new report finds, we've talked about this before, there's a new study. Study says harmful gases linked to heart and lung diseases shave nearly two years off a person's life, mostly due to NOx emissions. So that's from The Guardian. I am currently breathing oil from an oil refinery. My political parties don't give a crap. They don't understand. They just brush it aside. Let James die. Let all the people in his neighborhood die and the half the people in the city. Brian, you know what? I've got this air purifier now in my bedroom where I like to have an open window because it gets too hot for all the equipment in here and stuff. And even in the wintertime and cold days, I like to have fresh air. I close the door so it doesn't cool the house, just keeps my fresh air in my room. Well, the thing's been going off when I don't smell the refinery. This is concerning because most of the cost of that thing is the, you know, the detector for different, you know, particulate matter and stuff like that. That's the detector is most of what this thing is. It's been going off a lot when I don't smell the refinery. And then I look at the weather and said, oh yeah, the weather is from that kind of direction. So now I'm thinking, how much air did I think was clean that I've breathed, have I breathed for the last 15 years and 100,000 other people in its general path? That's, it's concerning. We got to get rid of it. If you listen to the show, you know, there all are, there are alternatives. Anyway, this is from Bloomberg. Pardon me. Qatar Energy joins Total to build a very large solar farm in Iraq. We haven't talked about Iraq ever. Well, except for oil. The two energy companies already cooperate on a gas venture. This is 1.25 gigawatts of solar, which would power 350,000 homes. Qatar Energy and Total Energies are developing a project to capture gas also from three oil fields which would otherwise be burned off into the atmosphere and use it to supply power plants. Why not? We should do that in North Dakota and here, where there's a lot of that going on. This will help Iraq reduce its dependence on imports of fuel from those bastards over in Iran. You know, <laughs> why not? Energy independence in the Middle East, it's a thing. The total number of Tesla superchargers is up 20% this year. 20% despite a tumultuous spring when everyone was fired. Inside EVs has a story on that. Sri Lanka is going to install rooftop solar at religious sites. Buddhist temples, churches, mosques, and Hindu temples across Sri Lanka are receiving five kilowatt rooftop solar installations free of charge from God or maybe the government. The project backed by a $17 million investment from the Indian government is expected to add 25 megawatts of solar to the grid. This is from PV Magazine. Go check that out if you're interested in learning more. And why is it the Indian government funding Sri Lanka? Probably a political thing that I don't understand. European gas industry abandons a deal to retrain workers for low carbon economy. Yes, the Just Transition European Framework Agreement was designed to provide guarantees and that's been, they couldn't come to an agreement over the summer and it's backed off. It's a new high for California electric vehicles, according to three third quarter uh, 2024 results. California's EV share of sales reached 27.1% with battery electric, making up the vast majority at 23.7% of new vehicles sold were battery electric. And there's a link to that story from cncda.org. China auto analyst Michael Dunn says tariffs are inducing China investment in overseas plants. China automakers have built plants in nine countries with an annual production capacity of 1.2 million vehicles. That number will more than double by 2026. That's a lot of electric vehicles. I remember when we reached a million in the world. You know, there's a lot that's happened. We we're coming up on our fifth anniversary after the holidays, and a lot, so much has happened since that. We used to talk about every new vehicle that came out. Yeah. Now one comes out every day, and we, we couldn't possibly talk about it unless we had a separate podcast. Yeah, and if there's tariffs in your country for things like Chinese electric vehicles, well, if they build a factory in that country, they can avoid the tariffs, and this is what they're looking and hoping to do. In battery advancement news, CATL unveiled its Freevoy battery for plug-in hybrid vehicles. Yeah, a battery made for plug-in hybrid vehicles. So get this. You know, usually you'd have like 40 kilometers, which was a common thing. Now that's up to like 70. Yeah. They're talking about 400 or 250 miles of range. Then you have a gas engine that pops up after that. Why? 
Why, I ask? The pack is a, a mix of lithium and sodium ion batteries, so it's a hybrid, and it claims it can discharge at minus 40 degrees, which gets my interest because once in a while, very occasionally, every couple of winters or so, it's minus 40 here. So, like to like to hear that. Ours work, but they're heated. It's saying if it's not heated and it's just sitting there, it will still work in minus 40. My pack has never gotten that cold, but yeah. Power performance and packs heat up just by charging them, right? So if you're charging them overnight, they tend to get a little bit of heat in there too. Power performance in a hybrid rises by 20% with these new batteries. I don't understand it though. Why, why carry around a combustion engine when you can go 250 miles? Like why? Yeah. Um, that seems a bit there are some special case scenarios, maybe, maybe, but we'll see if Barry gets one. By 2030, the free void battery will be used in 30 hybrid models. It's already going to the models. So this isn't an announcement from a lab. This isn't a, theoretically we could do this. That's already going into some models and it will be a lot more not too long from now. So what is the point of carrying around that? I don't know. Could charge in 15 minutes. That's it's got fast charging too. It's got 4C charging. So that's crazy. This is from PV Magazine, okay? PV Magazine says that Jinko Solar announced new Topcon solar modules with efficiency of 24.8%. That's pretty good. The Chinese manufacturer said the new Tiger Neo 3.0 modules are available in two versions of outputs, 495 watts and 670 watts. That's a big panel. Yeah, that efficiency number for solar panels, it always ticks up 1 or 2% every year or two. It's tough to get higher than that, but 24.8 is very, very good. And finally this week, we have talked a lot about recycling batteries and how 96 to 99% of minerals can be recycled depending on who's doing it and what country and how they're doing it. And because batteries are becoming more powerful in the volume they take up, it actually surpasses the 100% recycling rate because those minerals go into batteries that give you more power than the batteries they came from. Yeah, they go into Tell a Tell that to your racist battery. uncle at, at Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving. It's crazy that the new battery is more powerful than the old battery due to the improvements in the recipe, essentially. So, with the same apparently true with silicon, Brian, did you know that? When you're recycling silicon, this is not something we've done a lot. Yeah. Because... We haven't had to. <laughs> yeah. Silicon panels last 25 years or 30 years, and there's not a lot around. You know, they're just starting to think about it now. Yeah. Recycling of solar panels is going to become a very big thing soon. And yeah, they'll go into panels that are more efficient than what they came out of. The silicon in a 50 watt solar panel from 2004 can be used to make a 400 watt silk watt panel today. <laughs> wow. Mind blowing. Keep your mind together. Tape it together because that's, that's the, crazy. We use about an eighth as much of the silicon to make a watt of solar panels as we did 20 years ago. Imagine, imagine 20 years from now when we're actually working on this and, and billions of these panels are being made. I mean, what was happening 20 years ago? Hardly anything. Consequently, energy payback is about five times faster than it was 20 years ago. A modern solar panel is more efficient and more durable. It will produce 25% more power per square meter after 30 years than the old ones are than the previous uh, generation, which is huge. If you import one ton of coal, Brian, you can burn it to generate two megawatt hours of electricity. If you import one ton, one ton of solar panels, you can use them to generate 1,000 megawatts of electricity. So a per ton basis there. Two megawatts versus 1,000 megawatts for a ton of coal versus a ton of solar panels. That is a great way to end the show. Please contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Around social media, we're Clean Energy Pod. And please join our Patreon. You can join for free or give us a little bit of money and get some extra perks. The link is in the show notes. And you can support us with a purchase from the uh, Clean Energy merch store. And that's in the show notes or on our website as well. And the video version of our podcast is released the weekend following the audio version on TikTok, Instagram, believe it or not, and YouTube. But it's going to be shorter this week. So if you want the full show, you'll have to listen to the audio podcast. And yeah, shout outs to our Patreon members. Hello and thank you. 
Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. If that's where you're listening, we appreciate that. And welcome to all new listeners. Please remember to subscribe on your podcast app because we do this every week. And I will see you next week. See you next week.